audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. This is Bigger Questions with your host, Robert Martin. Welcome to Bigger Questions. Today's show is recorded live in Brisbane in partnership with ISCAST, also known as Christians in Science, at their 11th conference on science and Christianity. Today's big question, do the heavens declare the glory of God? We're asking this question today to three astronomers and we have a stellar lineup here today. <laughs> it gets better. <laughs> My first guest is Dr. Jennifer Wiseman. Jennifer is an astronomer, author and speaker. She's one of the world's leading astronomers holding a PhD in astronomy from Harvard and she's even discovered a comet. Wiseman's skiff in 1987. Please welcome Dr. Jennifer Wiseman. <laughs> My next guest is Professor Ken Freeman. Ken is Duffield Professor of Astronomy at Mount Stromlo Observatory at the Australian National University. Ken is an eminent astronomer and a pioneer in the field of dark matter and in 2012 was awarded the Prime Minister's Prize for Science. Please welcome Professor Ken Freeman. And my third guest is Dr. Luke Barnes. Luke is a postdoctoral researcher at Western Sydney University. He has published papers in the field of galaxy formation and on the fine tuning of the universe for life. And he's also published a book with Geraint Lewis, A Fortunate Universe. Please welcome Dr. Luke Barnes. <laughs> Well, welcome all to Bigger Questions today. Today's event is a little bit like three astronomers walk into a bar. What happens next? Well, we're about to find out. So anyway, so as we begin, we want to deal with, we deal with the big questions in this, uh, in this show. So I want to get your thoughts on poor Pluto. It was once the ninth planet of our solar system, but more recently has been downgraded and no longer a planet. So how do you feel about poor Pluto? I'm here to report that Pluto is doing just fine. <laughs> In fact, we just sent a, a probe uh, near it, to, uh, the uh, New Horizons probe, and uh, took pictures, and we know that Pluto's doing well, so I think we can feel better about it. That's okay. Ex excellent. Well, that's good to know. Okay, well, we, to kick off bigger questions, we do like to ask a couple of smaller questions. We do try to have a bit of fun on the show. Today, we're asking three astronomers if the heavens declare the glory of God. So I thought I'd test you on, how much do you know about the science of Star Wars? Now, Star Wars, of course, is the world's most popular space series. Now, do you feel qualified at all? Are you fans of the show? Yeah. Well, which Star Wars? <laughs> yeah. well, we're not going to get that far. I suppose there's a whole bunch of them. Yeah. You, you inspired by Star Wars at all? My four-year-old would nail this, so I've got to live up to his standard. Okay, right. Well, anyway, well, there's two questions, both multiple choice. Question one. To overcome the massive distances between stars, spaceships in Star Wars use a special form of propulsion. What is it? Is it A, hyperdrive, B, warp drive, C, a V8, or D, a giant rubber band? So which of those is the form of propulsion used in Star Wars? Is it uh, ludicrous speed? Lud <laughs> <laughs> Bonus point, but not quite. Wait, we have, it's, one of, it's one of these four. It's, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. you I vote A. A, that's, a, that's pretty good. Yeah, any, any other, anyone else? What do you take, Ken? Go B. You go B. I wouldn't, but yeah, <laughs> you can, can try. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what about you, Luke? Which way are you going to go? Well, with that hint, I might go A. Okay, A. With the, yeah. Well, the answer actually surprisingly is A. That's right, yes. Um, A was yeah. Yeah. <laughs> B warp drive is actually from Star Trek, unfortunately, and I'm not sure about V8s or rubber bands. Now, the concept of travelling through hyperspace to overcome the massive distances between stars, is it really fantasy or is it scientifically plausible? <laughs> I have actually seen research done on this. So uh, with Geraint Lewis, who I wrote the book with, we've, uh, there have been papers written on what are called warp drives. Yeah. If you get the right sort of weirdness happening in general relativity, you can get from A to B faster than the speed of light. Wow. Uh, but you've got to bend space-time and do all sorts of other things that sound like they're from science fiction. Okay. But, uh, so the story is we don't know if that form of energy exists, but if it does, then, yeah, we can totally nail that. Don't worry about that. <laughs> <Sure. laughs> okay, you put it in a little yeah. spaceship and fly off as well and attack the Death Star. Great. Okay. Question. Question two, according to the book, The Science of Star Wars, which is the most notorious astrophysical error 
in the Star Wars movies? Oh, I know this oh, already. I okay. Know oh, well, yeah. Well, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, there's four options. Well, of a choice. Okay. This A is that the Star Wars depicts many habitable planets across the galaxy. Is it B that Han Solo claimed that his ship, the Millennium Falcon, was very fast because it made the Kessel Run in 12 parsecs? Is it C, Star Wars depicts a planet Tatooine ordering, orbiting a binary star system? Or was it D, the creation of the character Jar Jar Binks <laughs> in episode one, The Phantom Menace? So I think you've already got a... Which one are you going for there, Luke? You think um, yeah, definitely going for Parsecs. You're going to go for pa- B, Parsecs? I was going to go for the Kessel Run, the, the same one, until you mentioned Jar Jar Brinks, which I can't stand. So I actually think that was a worse error. Just to make sure that you don't get this one wrong, um, we're talking astrophysical errors, not oh, no, just no, not yeah, errors. Yeah, but it's an astronomical error. <laughs> 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 That's true, yes, yes. And what about you, Ken? Which are you, you, you're going to go for parsecs. You're going to go for parsecs as well, yes. And the answer, of course, is B. A parsec is, a, of course, is a... It's a unit of, of distance, not speed. A, a, exactly right. And, of course, well, the creation of Jar Jar Binks was possibly also an error, as he's considered one of the most hated characters in the history of film. But technically, it's not an astrophysical error, although perhaps an astronomical one. So, congratulations to our three astronomers. You are out of this world. For you, you got two of our two smaller questions right. Big round of applause. <laughs> Now, there are a number of things that Star Wars got right about the universe because it was once thought that planets outside our solar system were quite rare and that planets couldn't orbit binary systems. So, Jennifer, you you study stars and planetary formations. So, your thoughts on modern astronomical discoveries which inform um, this? Right. So, it's really become uh, common now to discover planets around other stars. And we didn't know, you know, just two or three decades ago, we didn't know of any planets around other stars, orbiting stars other than our sun. And now, given our developments in telescope technology, we have detected thousands of planets outside our solar system. And the statistics would make it seem that perhaps most stars have at least one planet. So, Planets are common, they got that right, and planets can orbit double stars, so they got that right too. So you could have a, a sunset with two, like, like Luke you, Skywalker you sitting there watching the, the sky, with the beautiful music in the yes. background? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah. So do you think there could be a galaxy with desert planets like Tatooine, ice planets like Hoth and forest moons like Endor? Is that plausible scientifically? Yes, yes, and yes. yes. <laughs> in, the sa- all the, in the same galaxy, perhaps? A yeah, because fire. it's just a matter of... Um, you know, how the planets formed and how close they are to their parent star and uh, their history of formation as to what kinds of elements might be available to that planet in its atmosphere. So, uh, theoretically, it's all very possible, but, you know, we're still looking, so... Hmm. Now, Ken, you spent a long time researching dark matter. Now, this is a bit different to the dark side of the force, isn't it? Is that right? Uh, Yeah, I believe so. (laughs) (laughs) Now, forgive my universe, but isn't most of the universe dark? So what exactly is dark matter? Well, um, it's dark. (laughs) And that's uh, that's pretty much all we know about it at this point. I do have more questions about this dark matter. <laughs> no, but in, in, in fact, it's getting more mysterious rather than less really? mysterious okay. as, as time goes on. Um, we, I, can, I can talk to you for great length about what it's not because <laughs> we've, we've actually looked for various kinds of dark matter and failed to find them, but we don't know what it is. Right. This is really quite, quite a problem at the moment. Yeah, so, in, so, so how did you discover this thing that you don't know that you've discovered? <laughs> the the way you discover dark matter is just by the it's 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 gravitating effect and it, gravity is actually pretty easy to measure mm-hmm. in astronomy. You just look at objects that are rotating, like spiral galaxies. You see how fast they're rotating, and that straight away gives you a measure of how much mass there is. And that's really what we did. Mm-hmm. Um, this sort of goes back into the early 70s, but it does depend on the assumption that Newton's inverse square law that we heard mentioned earlier in the day, that that inverse square law is correct. In a region in which it, in the region of acceleration in which it hasn't been tested, the Newton's laws have been pretty well tested in the solar system. Mm-hmm. Pluto um, is our outermost planet. The inverse square law works really well. Mm-hmm. When you go to, the, to galaxies, I mean, galaxies have huge masses, but they have also enormous sizes. And the 
acceleration in the outer parts of a galaxy is 10 to the minus 5 of the acceleration of Pluto's orbit. As Pluto goes around in a circle, it's accelerating mm -hmm. all the time. So we're operating in, in a region where it hasn't been tested. Now, that didn't stop. Now, everyone knows that assumption is made, and that didn't, hasn't stopped the paradigm of dark matter really catching on. It completely transformed our understanding of how the universe works, how galaxies formed. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it is still an assumption. And a number of people are looking to see if there are alternative laws of gravity that would let you walk away from dark matter as, as dark matter gets harder and harder to determine mm. what it is. Mm. Yeah. So where is it? Where is this dark matter? Well, it's, it's really everywhere. The room is full of it. Oh, um, <laughs> <laughs> oh excuse okay. me. Excuse me. That was not intended. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so what, what then are the implications then of this dark matter, something that's so, so common, so important, yet we just can't actually see, taste or touch or whatever? Like, what, what's the implications well, of I suppose this? the biggest implication was that galaxies could form as quickly as they did. Now, they didn't form very quickly. As Jennifer said, 13.8 uh, uh, billion, billion years it's, it's taken. But if it wasn't for dark matter... The galaxies could not have formed in that time. There just wouldn't wouldn't be enough mass. Mm. As I say, the room is full of it. It's passing it's passing straight through your body, and you don't feel a thing. Mm. Wow. So and so it's just obviously it's a, a massive mystery of science at the moment. It is. Yeah. So Jennifer, now you discovered a comet, the Wiseman Skiff. Now, what was it like when you discovered this comet? So this was really an unexpected, uh, amazing event. I was just an undergraduate student. I was trying to learn what astronomers actually do. I had a chance as a student to go with a, a group. A, a wonderful professor at my university would take a group of students every year out to Lowell Observatory, which is in Flagstaff, Arizona, which, by the way, is where Pluto was discovered. Okay. <laughs> But uh, I was just learning how to scan these photographs of the sky taken with a telescope there. And at that point, they were still using these glass plates. Anybody seen a glass photographic plate here? Yes. So, so I was looking at these pictures of the night sky taken with the telescope when there were distributions of stars in, in these images. I was scanning them. I was supposed to find a bunch of asteroids. And the, and the way you find them is you look at two pictures that were taken just a few hours apart from each other and the stars won't move in that short amount of time, but anything in the nearby solar system will kind of jump in position between those two exposures. And I wasn't finding any asteroids, as I was supposed to, but I did find this thing that had a long tail, and it really it looked like a comet. Now, it turns <laughs> out that it was actually just streaking across during the exposure time, but nevertheless, it was an un unexpected object, and we went back out with the telescope to see if we could find it again, which we did, and uh, so the, the Minor Planet Center in, in Massachusetts that keeps track of this stuff decided this was a new, newly discovered comet. And they, they named it. I, I didn't have anything to do with that. But they named it after myself and Brian Skiff, who's the astronomer who took the picture. So you can Google Comet Wiseman Skiff and read all about it. Yeah, yeah apparently there's not actually a great deal about it. Um, so it's actually not particularly big. Um, so well, what, where does it now, get now, now. It's... Uh, <laughs> It is true that it's a pretty dull and boring comet. I didn't say boring. Um, it's just not particularly big. But it comes back every six and a half years. It's a short period comet. So, right. you know, so we've got something up on Halley's Comet. It takes decades for Halley's. You can see it. Um, yes. Now, on November the 12th, 2014, the European Space Agency landed a craft on a comet. Is there any chance that they're going to land on your comet at all? I doubt it, but... <laughs> I'll tell you something really interesting, which is um, two things. In the context of our conversation, this is what I call my answer to prayer comet, because I was praying for a thesis topic that, that winter, and, uh, and then this, this, my, this discovery happened, and I was able to observe this comet for my senior thesis to graduate. Now, not all my prayers are answered in this stellar fashion, but it was, <laughs> it's absolutely true. And secondly, I think God has a sense of humor because a few years later, this is going to sound like a non sequitur here, like totally unrelated, but these rovers on Mars, you know how we've had these contraptions driving around on Mars for some years? 
Well, one of them was just taking pictures of the Martian surface and sending them back and got the Martian sky in the image. And there was a meteor streaking across the Martian sky. You know, one of these, we call them shooting stars. You know, these, these burning lights of debris burning up in the Martian atmosphere. Some scientists in France traced the trajectory of that meteor and decided that this was debris from the tail of Comet Wiseman's skiff. So isn't that amazing? Oh, so, yes. And that was published in, in Nature, Letters to Nature, so you can read all about it. Yes. Now, Luke, uh, it's intriguing. You've co-authored a book, A Fortunate Universe, with an atheist, Geraint Lewis. Can you tell us a bit more about that? Well, he started off, he was my honours supervisor uh, and then my master's supervisor and is now sort of my colleague. Um, and the thing about the book was I'd, he'd wanted to write a book and I'd given a talk about the fine-tuning of the universe for life, that the, the universe has various properties from, you know, how much electrons weigh up to how much dark matter there is. And the interesting thing is if you start messing around with these properties just in theory, you sort of ruin the universe. You can make a universe with no structure. Like, like, like Ken said, you can, you can make a universe which doesn't make any galaxies or you know, doesn't make any chemicals or anything. And we wrote uh, a book about that. And the interesting thing was that it has eight chapters and seven of them we were able to write together. And there was basically one footnote, which you can go and find, uh, which starts, at this point, our heroic authors disagreed about dot, dot, dot. Um, but other than that, we wrote together, and then chapter eight takes the form of a, a conversation between us about what all of this means. Mm. So the interesting thing about this, this sort of you know, fact about the universe is that a, a Christian and an atheist can write a science book together and agree on basically everything. Uh, the science is very solid. The question is, what on earth we do with it? Mm, mm. So, Tim, tell us a bit more about that final chapter. Without, I mean, obviously, you want us to buy the book, but um, tell us a bit more about what, what that, dis that conversation looked like. So, we, we considered four ideas, and the first one was that, well, we, we change, say, the, the, how much an electron weighs. You go to your equations, you change that number and see what happens. Maybe, actually, we can't do that. There's some deeper law that says, no, you can't change that number. So, that was option one. Option two is called the multiverse, okay? It, you know, it's the luck of the draw, what b bit of the universe gets what sort of properties, and just by luck we got the bit that uh, has all the right conditions for life, and of course those are the only bits of the universe that are asking the question about whether there's anyone scratching their heads. Right? There are no heads to scratch in the rest of the multiverse. Uh, and number three was uh, theism, just about whether there is a cosmic designer, whether there is a story to be told above the level, or if you like, below the level of the ultimate laws of nature. And the fourth was the, the idea that maybe the universe is a simulation as a cosmic designer, but not with an omni this and an omni that. Uh, it, that we are, in, in a very real sense, a simulation of, of some sort and what the implications of that might be. Uh, in the end, we, we both don't think that physics is the answer. Geraint went for a multiverse. Multiverse is a possibility for me, but I defended the idea that, that maybe there's a, a, that there is a designer. And we, we both sort of look with some suspicion on the idea that the universe is a simulation. Mm -hmm. So is the multiverse then a legitimate scientific theory or is it a way that cosmologists uh, try to avoid potential theistic implications of a fine-tuned universe with a beginning? I, I don't think it's just a way out of that particular, like the theistic problems. I think it's been suggested for other reasons and it's, it's, it's a physical model. It's a possible way the universe could be, but there are some major, uh, very, you know, high-ranking uh, cosmologists who say that this thing is not science. So George Ellison and Joe Silk are two of the major, you know, two of the big names, uh, who, who's, who wrote an article together saying this is not science. What do you think you're doing? These are, uh, these are universes we can't possibly observe or, or, measure uh, or, or get to or see in any, in any direct way. When you get one of these theories, if it's, if it's well-defined enough, I can do something with it. I can derive predictions. We've been doing, actually, simulations of the universe with different properties to try and do this kind of thing. On that level, we can attack it scientifically. Mm -hmm. So does a fine-tuned universe mean a designed or an optimal universe? No. Uh, all it means is when, when you've got an idea in physics and you have to make an assumption... In, as part of your sort of model of the universe, what you then want to go do is change that assumption and see if it ruins the whole model, whether your assumption has to sit on a knife edge. So that's what we mean by fine-tuned. And, and all that fine-tuning for life is, all right, let's change these numbers and see what happens to the conditions for life. 
Now, atheist Christopher Hitchens found the fine-tuning argument for the existence of God as most intriguing and admitted that it wasn't a trivial thing to engage. Now, does fine-tuning provide a potential pointer to a fine-tuner? I think, from my perspective, the first thing it does is sort of light a fire underneath the naturalist. If you think that physical nature is just all there is to reality, then it's a bit of a shock to find that actually there's a whole heap of other ways this universe could have been, and if you're a naturalist, there's no reason why it's this way rather than some other way, and yet this universe has some astonishingly fine-tuned properties, and yet these laws underneath the universe don't look like an accident at all. Pick one at random from the possibilities, and you probably end up with a ruined universe with no chemistry and no structure. Right, now... You're all Christian believers, so what was it that convinced you become, to become a Christian believer? Was it your astronomy, your science, or was it something else? Ken, do you want to kick us off? I have a very boring um, Christian history because I've always been a Christian, as far back as I can remember. I was taken to Sunday school in, in, in the Baptist Sunday school, and I was quite small. And I've got to say, I've never looked back. So, <laughs> so what was it that convinced you to stay coming, going to church or being a Christian? Um, was it something to do with your science or was it, just, was it something else? A- absolutely nothing to do with science at all. Okay, so what was it? What was it that convinced you? I was just convinced. <laughs> um, no, no, I mean, I, I, I gave a similar answer last year at a, at a, at a, a meeting at the um, World Science Festival. And I, A.C. Grayling was on the panel as well. How did he take that? He was absolutely appalled. A.C. <laughs> Grayling is a very nice man, and we got on really well. Right. <laughs> but he, he was absolutely appalled. But it, it is true. There's this thing that Calvin wrote about called sensus divinatus. Calvin makes the case that there's a vague... that people have a vague sense of the divine, and he doesn't go in, in any more detail than that. But he says it's, it's something that is part of being a, a human... And I guess that's that's about all I can say. I've, I've always had it. Wow. I've, I've always been a, always been a believer. So it's really not, not much to say. How about you? <laughs> <laughs> but thank, no, thank you very much, Ken. That's very interesting. Um, Jennifer, your your experience. What's what's convinced you to to be a Christian? Was it your science or something else? I think pretty similar to Ken. <laughs> I agree. I grew up uh, in a Christian family and and a loving church, and I so I think. You know, these people weren't perfect by any means, but I think I really saw the, the the life of God in these people, and it impressed me from a young age. Um, I think I was also it was also impressed upon me during my youth that there there was a choice to be made as to whether to to intentionally be a follower of, of Christ or or live for yourself and. Um, I think I was influenced by by the late Billy Graham and some of his preaching, but uh, I, may, you know, as a child could do, I made that commitment. So life is very dynamic, and for me, and I'm sure for many, faith is about looking afresh to our Lord, to Christ, for each new situation that life brings and to find out what God wants from us in this situation and how to live faithfully and fruitfully in these new situations. So that's what my faith has been more about, the challenges and joys of discipleship than, than actually coming to faith, which, which really came to, to my life at an early age. You know. How about you, Luke? What was it that convinced you to be a Christian believer? Was- Actually, it worked the other way around that, that uh, my, my Christianity was one of the things that drew me into science mm-hmm. in that, um, in, in sort of two ways that, that he, he was, you know, something that was obviously a noble pursuit, but at the same time here is something that the, the people who didn't believe what I believe were saying that here's where the real test of, of Christianity comes. It's coming from the sciences. Uh, and, and that sort of, you know, in a backwards way kind of drew me in. So you, uh, and, you were challenged and, in some ways. It was like yeah. a, it, was a, it was the challenge. I mean, there's two. So uh, the philosopher Peter Kraft, who said, uh, you know, if your faith is weak and you don't want to have a challenge, don't go and read the Brothers Karamazov. Right now, there's two types of people: the people who won't, and the people who will go and read the Brothers Karamazov. Now that I've said that, and I did, I have. So that's that's where I was at, and uh, ultimately found that that the, there were good answers to the sorts of critiques that were were being thrown at Christianity. Mm. So now, the more that you learn about astronomy, space, and the heavens, do these discoveries uh, threaten or enhance your idea of God? Maybe you could kick us off there, Luke, just to continue on. So I, I think they enhance it in a couple of ways. So 
um, we just saw some pic- some beautiful pictures, as one on the screen now, of, of of the universe. You show one of these wonderful Hubble images, and the whole crowd goes, "Whoa!" and you, when one of these, when when we have a, our astronomy seminars, when there's just astronomers in the room and we're discuss, discussing the latest, you know, astronomy, if one of those pictures come up, we all go, "Whoa!" Like none of that changes. The universe is still impressive, no matter how many times you've looked at it, how deeply you've looked at it. Uh, so that level of uh, one of the wonderful things I find about Christianity, as opposed to, to naturalism, is I can look at that and say that's beautiful without having to to give put an asterisk and say actually beauty is just some sort of evolved response to this that and the other. You know, I can just say that's that's a beautiful thing. In the same way, I can say goodness is good without any asterisk on that as well. So that was that's one of the major things. Um, this. Uh, you know, details about the size of the universe and the way that we fit into the universe, fine-tuning, has been something that sort of fits into my Christian, Christian worldview in a fairly natural and easy way. And I think, again, as I said before, sort of lights a fire underneath the, the naturalist. Now, another question's come in from our text line here. It says, if you are open-minded scientists, are you open to being convinced that God does not exist? Uh, that is, what kind of evidence would convince you to give up your faith? Yeah, I've, I've, I've thought about this one a, a bit, but I, I honestly can't think of anything that would cause me to give up my faith because I just cannot imagine what it could possibly be. Mm-hmm. I think uh, since I did not come to faith based on scientific arguments, that I wouldn't be prone to losing my faith based on scientific arguments because that's not why I became a believer in the first place. The God that we understand in, in Christianity is is a person, is a, is a being. You come to faith in God and is a, in a relationship with with God and. Um, that relationship is is personal and it's meaningful and it's real, and so there isn't some sort of new scientific discovery that can actually, you know, pull that rug out uh, from under you. Now there are scientific discoveries that can make you have to kind of rethink your your you know if you have a a certain picture in your mind of the framework in which you think God is operating in the natural world, and then you learn something through science that basically challenges and broadens that particular aspect of your faith, absolutely. You know, I think, I think um, we should always be humble and open to, to learning new things and reconsidering the, the frameworks that we have constructed in our minds. But I, I just can't see how any new information from science would do anything but simply enrich my understanding of reality and therefore of, of God. But um, I'll pass. Well, today's big question is, do the heavens declare the glory of God? So perhaps let's consider the vastness of the heavens. So how many stars are there in the universe? Have you counted them all? <laughs> Well, you have to do a bit of mathematics here, um, and so we think that there are something like um, 400 billion galaxies in the observable universe, and I, I might have to define what I mean by that, and then in each one there can be hundreds of billions of stars. So just, you know, roughly if you can multiply 400 billion by, let's say, 200 billion on average, you're going to come up with... Uh, some very, very large number of stars. Um, now, uh, you know, there, there's got to be all kinds of caveats here because not all stars live for the same amount of time and so forth and so on, but um, there are more stars than we can comprehend, and and now we know planets are common, so it's, it's truly mind-boggling. Yeah. It is. Given that mind-boggling in nature, how could you think that humans are significant at all, given the vastness of this universe? So skeptic Michael Shermer wrote, Finally, from what we know about the cosmos, to think of all that was just created for just one species among the tens of millions of species who live on one planet circling one of a couple of hundred billion stars that are located in one galaxy among hundreds of billions of galaxies, all of which are in one universe among perhaps an infinite number of universes, all nestled within a grand cosmic multiverse, is provincially insular and anthropocentrically blinkered. So are we important? I think there's a couple of things to say there. It's no part of Christianity, I think, that we're the sole purpose of the universe. And we don't measure significance with size. I mean, if my house is on fire, I mean, I'm not going back for the load-bearing beams, right? I'd, I'd run back in for my kids, but they do nothing to hold up my house, right? That We don't measure significance in the sort of broad physical 
you know, you know, moral significance. Can something think? But so far as we know, we're the only ones in the universe, the only things in the universe that think. And in that, can, uh, in, in if you're thinking of moral significance, we're the only ones who do morally significant actions. So on that scale, which is more like significance than physical size, then then there is that sort of case there. Um, I, I think the the point of having a big universe is that it's the best physical. Uh, approximation we have of a very big God. That's a very simple way to put it. But if you're trying to imagine the infinity of God, staring at the infinity of the universe for a while will help a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have anything to add, Ten? Yeah. This was quite a big problem for people a few hundred years ago, even with the rather restricted view that they had of the cosmos. I mean, they probably could see a few thousand stars and they realised their insignificance. Um, but they didn't realise just how insignificant we really are, not, not, not just on the scale of the universe, but even where we are in the universe. We're, we're in a random galaxy, and our galaxy is right out at the edge of a, a filament, or right out at the edge of a, what's called the local supercluster. We could hardly be in a more remote place. So we certainly don't get our significance from where we are. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, I, I, would, I would again turn to the scriptures and say there was an incarnation... And that was for us. And I think that makes us incredibly significant. Mm -hmm. well, we'll get to that in a second, because today's big question is, do the heavens declare the glory of God? And the Bible itself speaks to this question. Psalm 19 is a song in the Old Testament, and Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens declare the glory of God, the skies proclaim the work of His hands. Now, the author here claims that the heavens do indeed declare the glory of God. In what way do you think that they do that? Well, I think we can glean some thoughts on this by looking at the universe and, and taking into account what we've learned in modern astronomy. I don't think that astronomy, that the science gives us direct information about God. We don't prove God through a telescope, for example. But I think if you are a person um, with faith, looking through eyes of faith, you can glean something about the character of God by looking at the universe and um, in these kind of um, philosophical inferences. And in that sense, to me, it seems that God is um, patient, allowing the universe to unfold over billions of years, just these kind of unfathomable cosmic times, but in a direction that leads to life, you know, there, there's a, there seems to be purpose behind it just by seeing how the universe is, is developing. Again, that's, that's a kind of philosophical inference, but to me, it's, a, it's one that, that rings um, congruent with what we're seeing in the universe. I think these kind of physical laws that are governing the universe are incredible, um, they have enabled things like stars to form, and stars themselves are little cosmic factories that produce heavy elements that we absolutely need for planets and life, and especially for advanced life that can have the conversation we're having right now. So all of that kind of provisional uh, aspect of the universe, I think, speaks to something about God's glory. Certainly the beauty, the magnitude... Uh, all of those things, I think, tell us, give us some clues about the character of God. Mm. Luke, Ken, anything to add? Any other thoughts? One of my favourite verses in the Old Testament is Isaiah. It just says, uh, lift your eyes and look to the heavens who created all these. So I think in the history of, you know, in the history of civil, you know, human beings, that the question, where did all this stuff come from? has been a major pointer towards a, a creator, even if it's not the most, you know, watertight argument there. I think that the, the way most people have realised, you know, most people have looked around and seen the way the universe all fits together, even their own, the universe we can see, let alone the stuff we see in the fundamental laws to the larger scale of the universe, and seen something that looks like it fits together, that looks like it's been planned out. Mm. Well, the late, great Stephen Hawking once says, before we understood science, it was natural to believe that God created the universe, but now science offers a more convincing explanation. So is Hawking right? No. <laughs> what science does is describe the natural world. We, we take observations of the world and we try and fit it together within a, a, a mathematical theory and we find that there are patterns underneath. But none of that process 
answers the bigger questions about where it came from or who is sustaining it. Describing the work of an artist does not replace the artist. I don't... So I, I think there's a this very naive picture there that if you've explained one natural thing in terms of another natural thing, that you can keep doing that forever and explain all the natural things. And that's just not true. Mm. So as scientists, are you any less awestruck by the the creation? Because now you know the physical process about how this happened? Oh, no, just the opposite. I think... Um as a scientist, I am more awestruck when we do understand how things work. Uh, um, I, I find that to be most gratifying and most exciting that it appears, as, as a Christian, I would put it this way, that God creates a universe that works, you know? <laughs> that, so it's not the things we don't understand, to me, that should cause us to say, you know, there's proof of God right there. We don't understand how something works, so ha, there's God. It's that it's when we do understand that we can say, that's amazing. Or occasionally we say, you know, that's very troubling. I, I understand the physics of how this works. Let's say, you know, earthquakes or things like that. I understand the physics, but then it causes you to ask, you know, perhaps some more difficult questions. Why would God put together physical forces that could lead to suffering? Those are very valid questions, but I think they're satisfying both for these positive reactions and these more troubling questions, but they're satisfying when they're based on the fact that we do understand how things work and we 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 believe God is responsible for it. Mm. Yeah. Well, to our three astronomers, so wrapping up, do the heavens declare the glory of God? Final thoughts? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think the size of the universe is one of the most... It is basically, as I said before, one of the best pointers towards the infinity of God. I think that's why it's that big. And to you, that reveals the glory of God? Yeah, if you wonder at the handiwork, then you wonder at the Creator. Let me leave you with the Bible's answer to the big question, do the heavens declare the glory of God from Psalm 19.1? The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of His hands. I look forward to you joining us next time for Bigger Questions. Please thank our guests today, Dr. Jennifer Wiseman, Professor Ken Freeman and Dr. Luke Barnes. Enjoy Bigger Questions? You can help us keep asking them for as little as $1 a podcast. Support the show. Go to patreon.com slash bigger questions. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au.